The Beavers set for their home finale as Arizona State heads to town. Oregon State still searching for their first win under Corey Hall. What changes might he make to get it done? And we update you on the coaching search. What does this program need to succeed? A brand new edition of Go Beavs starts now. Well, the season is winding down. Only two more chances for the Beavers to get a Pac-12 win this season. Could it come against Arizona State tomorrow? They've had an equally unpredictable season, so we will see. Welcome in to Go Beavs, Amanda Maynard, Jason Jean-Baptiste, Lindsey Schnell. Still to come, a closer look at Arizona State and the challenges that they pose. And we're going to talk a little women's basketball as they start the season. Uh, lots of exciting stuff to come for them. But first... What everyone is wondering about, what does the future of the Beavers <laughs> program look like here? Uh, can this be a big time program and what will it take to get there? What does a big time program mean? Well, uh, an elite level, competing. We're, competing for what? Okay, Say they, top 25. They should go will to they a bowl game. They, yeah, they've been a top 25 program. They were a top 25 program under Mike Riley, like semi-routinely, I would say. Yeah, and certainly, so. And certainly under Dennis Erickson. They should be going to a bowl game. Are they going to be competing for the college football playoff? I don't think so. Um, I think that they can push to go to the Pac-12 North, uh, the Pac-12, the Pac-12 title game, and win the Pac-12 North. You know, maybe every few years. Yeah, what do you I, think? I, th I think I think it's going to be leaps and bounds in order for them to get to that uh, level of play. Uh, I mean, you have a program that you know it's only won one game as of right now, so. Uh, you can't expect too much out of them right now. So no matter who comes in, whether it's a Les Miles, whether it's a Bo Baldwin, it's going to take time to get their type of players in that um, program and be able to compete at that level. But even still, it's going to be very, very difficult, very, very hard to continually be in that top 25 uh, competing for the bowl, you know, like the uh, college uh, playoffs year in, year out. This isn't Alabama. This isn't, you know, Ohio State. This isn't one of those types of programs. From from looking at the, the graphic we had just up about some of the other possible openings, the ones that we know are, are open, who are they really uh, going, going up against? What's going to have the biggest impact on Oregon State? That's a great question. Uh, search. To me, one of the biggest impacts is does Washington State open? Sure. Um, does Mike Leach go elsewhere? Um, if he does, you know, Bo, I think Bo Baldwin is like the best hire that Oregon State could make for a lot of reasons. That's in the mix, you know, and makes and is realistic. Um, but if Washington State opens, I would think that he would want to go to Washington State. Yeah. So then also if ASU opens, if UCLA opens, those are coaches that you're going to be competing against in recruiting battles because yeah. you're going to go into California and Arizona to get so many kids. Um, you know, are you, you're not competing with Florida. Florida offers, is yeah, in the that's, process that's, of yeah. offering Chip Kelly. Chip <laughs> Kelly's not coming to Corvallis. Right. Um, you know, Nebraska's going to go after Scott Frost. Sure. Yeah, I, I think ASU, uh, UCLA, and, you know, Washington State as well, too. I mean, it, <laughs> Quite frankly, any team that's in, yeah. that's in, is, that's in the conference is, is competition. You know what I mean? Uh, at the end of the day, UCLA offers things that Corvallis doesn't. You know, the weather, the, the, the uh, facilities, the program, the, the historic, uh, you know, all the history that the UCLA has. Arizona State, same thing. The weather, you, you're down south, you, you know, you're not dealing with the northwest weather. Um, and Washington State, you know, pretty much has had a better season, had, has had a better year, a couple years than Oregon State has too. So you, you're coming and you're, you have better players. So yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different things. The other thing to think about is I, I'm interested to see are there any openings in the Big 12, you know, that we're not thinking about right sure. now yeah. that could play a role because you're going to be drawing from a similar set of candidates. For example, um, Old Miss is open. Okay, Oregon State's probably not going to be in the mix for people that are at Old Miss because you got to think recruiting connections. You want someone who has West Coast ties who can recruit right. in the West because well, it's great if someone comes, you know, when Taggart came to Oregon from Florida, that's great. But Oregon is a much more appealing school than Oregon State for a variety of reasons. Yeah. I know people don't want to hear it, but it's the it's bottom. True. It's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's something. What, what goes on in the Big 12? Yeah. You mentioned recruiting ties. Obviously, that's key. What other types of things are you looking for in a candidate? So do you think that it needs to be, I want to know your opinion on this. I think it needs to be a, someone who has been a head coach before. I don't. Uh, so here's, here's a th I don't necessarily think that, that, that that's a given or that you need that because, you know, one of my top candidates, the person that, you know, just came on 
onto the scene recently is the uh, Alabama coach, you know, Ty, uh, Tosh Lupoy. I think he would be great. I mean, he's young. He's a great recruiter. Right. Uh, granted, he doesn't have head coaching experience, but he could get assistance. But if you've been kind of mentored that, under exactly, Nick Saban, I mean, yeah, how far does that go? That, but also, sorry. My, the thing, the reason that I think it's important is that Corvallis is unique, as yes. we were just talking about. It's not about it being a bad place. It's the, it, the set of challenges in Corvallis is different than almost everywhere else in the country. So I think you need someone who has already figured out the challenges of being a head coach and doesn't have to figure out both those things simultaneously. Sure. Yeah, and, and here, here's the thing that I'd say to that is that I agree with that, but at the same time, what you need to do is you need to get the players up here first before you can even get to that point, right? Um, so I think you need to have someone that has the ability to get the players here, be a, a hell of a recruiter. And a lot of times, a lot of these co head coaches are not that. A lot of times it's the assistant coaches that are the, the better recruiters. Right. So um, I, I think if you do end up having a coach that does have head coaching experience, then you better damn well have uh, assistant coaches that are able to recruit up here because, oh, like you said, Oregon State is a hard place to recruit. And real quick, how tough is it what they're inheriting on the schedule that came out this week <laughs> ohio state the no first biggie. game no big at deal. ohio state not a big deal no, right no, no biggie no biggie Does, ohio state just happens to be one of the best programs in all if, the whole if you're, country again you're inheriting that i mean are you just like okay this is well, gonna be what it is i like, mean one thing that's hard is that the pac-12 plays nine conference games yeah. other conferences don't do that the pac-12 north is arguably the toughest division in college football so there's, you know, you're walking into a challenge, you know, one way or another. Yeah, but I can tell you this, they're looking forward to that second game. Right, <laughs> Southern Utah. Uh, is that like when they were looking forward to Portland State? Hey, easy, off? easy, easy there. Come That's on. But, I mean, but uh, the truth of the matter is, is that whoever, whomever the coach is that uh, comes in and takes over the program is that they're going to have a hard time you know, uh, developing their players and getting their players in the system before the Ohio State game. I mean, the Ohio State game right. is a given loss. Yeah. Just bring in someone that knows how to develop quarterbacks. Right? Freedom. All right, a little later in the show, we're getting to know one of the stars of the secondary. Like, when I was hurt, I always thought to myself, as soon as they clear me, I was going I was gonna hit it and go hard. And as soon as they clear me, every day, I just work out, like, uh, twice a day. Oh, twice a day, man. And it's senior day tomorrow. Who's left the biggest impact on the program? Ocean. Garrison off balance. Touchdown, Beavers! Garrison into the end zone. Touchdown, Beavers! Garrison out of the backfield to Null. Null made a great move. Hit it with the sauce. Oh, oh. touchdown, Beavers! This is our Hyundai highlight of the week brought to you by your local Hyundai dealer and Daryl Garrison's career winding down at Oregon State. He's coming off one of his best performances of the season against Arizona. 209 yards, four touchdowns, and of course it is senior day coming up tomorrow. Garrison and Jordan Villeman reflecting on what it means to them. It's going to be fun. You know, um, last home game, it's kind of interesting, kind of wild. Uh, it's all coming to a close really, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a part of growing up, right? It's part of maturing and moving on and working to better things. I haven't really talked to any of the seniors. I kind of, you know, might just, just go with the flow and just, you know, just jump right into it and see how it goes, you know, see how I take it. You know, it's, it's, it's a different space for everybody, but, I mean, I probably talked to Storm and Larry and then probably Larry this week and Dev just to see, like, how, you know, they handled the whole, you know, senior day the last game on, on in Reese or so. I'll, I'll probably talk to them later this week, but mostly I'm just, you know, just going to with, you know, just happy, you know, just, you know, just decided to be playing in research again. I probably have to, you know, calm myself down every once in a while during, before the game starts. I'll probably get too anxious, you know, or during the game, you know. So I'll probably have to, you know, just tell myself to breathe and relax, you know, just remember it's another football game. It's fun. It's a game, you know, just go out there and just play. All right, senior day coming up Saturday. Jason, what was that day like for you? Uh, it, it was rainy. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it rained a lot, really. It rained a lot. But, you know, the one thing I, I remember is, like, all the emotion that, that you have during that day. I mean, it's your last day. For a lot of players, it's the last day that they'll ever uh, lace them up, you know. So, uh, really emotional, some tears, you know, your family members are there enjoying that time with you. Um, but you want to go out and you want to perform at your best, you know, and you want to come out and have the best game that you've ever had because you know that it could potentially be your last game. Did you have a big game that day? I did have a good game that day. Yeah. Did you guys play? Uh, Stanford. Okay. Yeah. So, and we actually won that game. 
All so. right. That was back in the day when Stanford wasn't very good, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> that was back in the day when we were good. No, yeah, no, I didn't mean that as a knock on you guys. I just meant, like, that was before the Stanford that we all know now. You know, you think sure. about, like, young Oregon State fans now, and, like, it's just fascinating to think about who who is known in the conference yeah. as being tough to play. Yeah, yeah. 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 We spanked that out. <laughs> well, well, let's take a look at those uh, the seniors on this roster. Uh, this season, quite a few of them. Again, it, it's hard to believe. Look at this list. I mean, Thomas Steiner, he could apply for medical red shirt. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Of course, Daryl Garrettson, Jordan Villeman. Uh, and we asked you to vote on who you felt like had made the biggest impact. And it's Jordan Villeman with 41%. That is their top senior pick. What do you guys think about that? Uh, silence. Did uh, silence. Yeah, that, that, I can't. That just, um, that's how's that possible? For you? That's, I, I, I mean, it's just shocking to me because I, we talked about this on Wednesday. I really like Jordan. I think he has an awesome personality, but I think that his career has been mostly disappointing. Don't you feel like there's such there's such a, a bias? How is it not my uh, uh, He's the best player, but defense, defensive uh, uh, players was, never was, get lost. No, and, and, so. and, that, and that's the problem right there. You know, is the fact that like, listen, this is a team sport. It's not just about the offense. Sure. You know? It's about the defense too. And Manon, the, it's not even close. Manasseh right. <laughs> definitely has had the better career. He's definitely a, is the one that's leaving a legacy. I mean, here you have a player who you know, had 20 tackles in one game. 20, 20 tackles in one game was the defensive player of the week in all the pack. So, I mean, to say that Jordan, who only has 15 receptions, 16 receptions on the year, is the one leaving a legacy, what are you looking at? Right. Like, like seriously, what are you looking at? You're looking at, uh, you're, you're daydreaming. You're daydreaming. I mean, point blank. Manasseh, hands down, without a fact, without a doubt. What Ed said, Ed said Fred, because he can, he can, well, he's uh, personal, uh, uh, you know, and he's back. Of course he'll pick the <laughs> office of Miami. So this has obviously been a challenging four years for this senior class. Absolutely. What is their legacy? Uh, you know, just like I said on uh, on Tuesday, is that I think their legacy is the fact that they haven't gone to a bowl game. You yeah, know, five and, and seven, best year. You know, and, and, and it's sad because you know you you have talent on this on this senior in this senior class, but it's the fact that they haven't had a bowl game. It's also haven't gone through two uh, different coaches. You know, you, you start you had Riley, then you had uh, on Coach A, and actually now on to Coach Hall. So three different coaches within that time frame. I mean, that's going to be hard. Yeah, to me, it's going to be about, like, was this the... <laughs> I don't think it's fair to blame this on the kids, but I think that sometimes that happens. Was this the class in the beginning of, not the end, but of like a cratering of sorts for this yeah. program? So much about this, this senior class legacy we're gonna know in five to 10 years, depending on where the program is. Yeah. I wanna know, out of that list of seniors, who has the best pro potential? Uh, I, I'd say That's a really good question. Yeah, I, I'd actually say I'd still say Manasseh. I mean, Jordan has the the physical capabilities to be a pro caliber mm -hmm. uh, receiver, but he hasn't put it all together. Now, if he gets uh, the right, you know, uh, you know, coach to help develop him, like during the off season, you know, uh, hits the, you know, gets him hits the weights and gets faster, then yeah, he has potential. But Manasseh is ready now. Yeah. yeah, the pro, OSU Pro Day will be really interesting for Villeman, yeah. you know, what type of numbers he puts up. Some kids are in a better situation when they just have to focus on football, you know, when school's right. over. And then Tyner is kind of the X factor here if he's going to come back or not because I think that he has big-time pro potential depending on what Tyner shows back. up. He should come back. All right, well, still to come, we're revealing who's moving on in our damn best bracket. And will Corey Hall be more hands-on with the defense this week? Our headlines are coming up next. Hey, welcome back. Look who's getting a scholarship offer this week. Chad Johnson Jr. He tweeted, honored and blessed to have received my second offer to the University of Oregon State. I wonder if he's going to get one to Oregon State University as well. Oh, Lord. But I'm ching. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, time now for our standard TV and appliance headlines with Lindsay Schnell of USA Today. Lindsay, what's our first one? Sticking with football? Yeah, of course we are sticking with football about Oregon State University, not the University <laughs> of Oregon State. Corey Hall this week after the Beavers lost to Arizona suggested that maybe he was going to take a bigger role in the defensive game planning. Let's hear what defensive coordinator Kevin Kloon has to say about that. 
Well, I hope he sees the corners coach, so I hope he's in the room. So, yeah. But he's going to be more involved than, than normal. So just what, what has his role been this week? Um, he's in the room, yeah. Anything different, or is it about the same? Yeah. Well, we're just trying to you know, all work together and all find a way to get this thing stopped. That was <laughs> kind of awkward. It's, it's been a rough year for Kevin <laughs> Kloon, man. You know, Gary Anderson calling you out. Now, somebody Let's else. Just, how about we all agree to stop throwing people under the bus? <laughs> that would be my vote for <laughs> whoever is the next head coach at Oregon State. And uh, some interesting uh, news of note for maybe the new head coach coming in. Yeah, so the 2018 football schedule got released today. The Pac-12, you know, schedule was also released. Um, so as you can see, the Beavers. How about this opening at Ohio oh, State? Man, oh that my is goodness! Tough. You know what's interesting <laughs> about that is that when Gary Anderson, a lot of times when new coaches come in, they'll see someone, see a big game on the schedule like that, and say, "Get that out of here! We need to play a Big Sky opponent." I'm sure that Gary Anderson kept it on the schedule because he thought, "Hey, year four, we'll be cruising." Now it'll be this. So that probably is not going to go super well. But good news, when they get into a Pac-12 play, they're going to miss UCLA, who will actually probably also be in a rebuilding year and likely have a new coach. And they're going to miss Utah. Um, they're going to host their two premier games at Research Stadium this year, USC and, of course, the Civil War coming back to Corvallis. So big news for the Beavers. You know, all these fans that are excited about the upcoming season, new coaching search, you got to start putting in for those tickets. And certainly a lot of people probably excited about women's basketball as they always are obviously uh, some names missing this year but there are still positive some positive and you want to talk about tickets and you know getting your tickets so supposedly there have been close to 6,000 tickets sold already for an 11 a.m. tip-off Sunday against Notre Dame wow. oh my goodness Notre Dame number six in the country of course perennial final four team how about this they have a, Notre Dame has a grad transfer on their roster Lily Thompson who played the last few years at Stanford so that's very familiar for Oregon State they also have a Rike a, Nguebu? No, that's how you say Bright's last name. The point is the girl <laughs> can score from anywhere. Um, Agun Bale, I say her name wrong all the time, but she's a baller. They're going to have to shut her down. This is huge. It's the only game this weekend between ranked teams. Uh, Oregon State coming in at 18, Notre Dame, of course, number six. Huge game for the Beavers. This could play a big role come March and seeding for the tournament. Amanda, even if they're missing some key pieces, this is a game that you want to take Notre Dame to the wire and put yourself in a position to win late in the fourth quarter. And they're missing some of that defensive prowess they had last season. So who's going to step up and be the defensive starter this year? That's all Lindsay. She was chatting with them at media day this year. Um, after Ruth Hamlin and uh, Gabby Hanson in the past two years being defensive stoppers, I think um, it'll be a more collective effort this year. I know Marie definitely has a lot of experience, um, so we'll play off her and hopefully a collective effort. I don't know if we'll have a known dis defensive stopper. I think we're all going to be, it's going to be a group effort. The defensive stopper this year, I honestly can't name one person. I think this year it's kind of, it's not just that we don't have a Gabby. I feel like there's five Gabbies. Like it should be everybody's kind of responsibility. And I think that's how we're all looking at it. We're not just thinking of, oh, this is the one person that can defend anybody. Like we're trying to make all five players def defend the other five opponents. I'm sure they would love to have five Gabbies on defense, right? Absolutely. You know, this is, first of all, I'm so excited for the game on Sunday, even though it's an 11 a.m. tip, which I'm not stoked about. Um, you know, first of all, um, this is a program coming off three conference championships, three defensive players of the year. Gabby obviously won it most recently. Before that, it was Ruth. And I'll tell you who we didn't talk to right there, but th the answer is Kat Tudor, the six-foot sophomore who's got quickness, who's got length, got a little bit of that mean streak. That's what Gabby had that made her so tough, besides the fact that she was just off the charts smart when it came to basketball IQ. But, Jason, I was curious, from a player perspective, do you feel like when you have to replace someone that was really productive on the defensive or offensive end, is that something that players talk about in the locker room? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, anytime that, especially with someone like that uh, was such a, a key, played a key role and was on vital to the team, you always have to talk about that within yourself because honestly, like you put it on yourself to be the person. Sure, that steps you don't want up. there to be yeah, a drop off. You don't want there to be like that void when that person leaves. So from a player perspective, inside the locker room, you're talking about it all the time. Like, okay, it's my time now. It's mm -hmm. my time to shine. It's my time to step up and be that person. So yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, my goal this year, you guys, is to make Jason into a huge women's basketball fan, <laughs> and I think that it's going to work <laughs> because, number one, they're awesome, and he is looking for a team that wins a lot. So yes. That would be women's very basketball. Much, yes, very and much And also, so. he's married to an awesome woman, and yep. he has two cute, adorable okay, little know. girls yeah. who are going to okay. be athletes, yep. and a third one on the way, so... Season tickets. Yeah, there God, there it is. <laughs> what, what is a realistic expectation for this team? So I think that they can, okay, so they're three-time defending champs, you know, um, and you know this because you were a player, Jason, like when you set that standard, even when you have to replace a lot afterward, the kids there, like there are kids on this roster that only know what it's like to win sure. a yeah. championship. Yeah, it's huge. So it's yeah, huge. I think it's huge. I think that they will be a top four team. I think that they will absolutely go back to the NCAA tournament. They'll Hopefully get a top 16 team, top 16 seed and host again. But if they win, I mean, you know this, great coaching and yeah, an attitude. Like, if they win another title, I won't be surprised. Yeah, and, and that's the um, biggest thing right there is the mentality of the players. I mean, the mentality of the players is huge because they know how to win. They know they've been there and done that before, right? So that's one of the biggest things, the biggest hurdles that you have coming from high school to college is that sometimes you don't know how, how to compete at that level. They have that. They have that experience. So now all you have to do is just you have to do it again over again. All right, still to come, who is the best defensive player in Oregon State history? We're one step closer to naming him, and the Beavers look to slow one of the Pac-12's best. You, you get guys that are that talented, a lot of times you got to stay after about working hard. Uh, you know, he's a guy that really works hard on the football field. One final game at Research Stadium this season as the Beavers host Arizona State this weekend. Still to come, down to our final four in our damn best bracket, and we're handing out our ingredients to victory. They try to snap a losing streak here in the fourth consecutive game. The yard line. Here comes the heat. Mannion had time. Got him in. Kelly over the middle, picked off! He's picked off! This might do it! Beaver score! The doctor! Well, an epic upset in 2014, and the Beavers have had their number over the last 14 years. We'll look at that in our Toyota opponent preview. They've won the last, they've won six of seven games against them in Corvallis. Uh, and a lot of people feel like that was the turning point for Arizona State's program to have some, some troubles. Uh, so they boast Manny Wilkins, dual threat quarterback, second dual, second week in a row that they're facing a dual threat quarterback. Obviously he's not Khalil Tate, uh, but what challenges does he bring? Oh, he's a dual threat quarterback. <laughs> He's got a better arm. He, he does. So uh, I guess for me, if, so if Khalil Tate was like, uh, quote unquote, Michael Vick, to me, uh, Manny Wilkins reminds me of Pat White. Like, like he's kind of like a poor man's version of a Pat White that used to play for West Virginia. Poor man's version. Uh, um, well, I mean, I'm just kidding. Uh, but he, you know, he has a better efficiency uh, when it comes to passing the ball. He doesn't turn the ball over as much. Um, he's not as athletic as a Khalil Tate or a Pat White was per se, but he's still athletic enough to make plays on, on like when he's running the ball, which is an issue for Oregon State uh, with uh, mobile quarterbacks. So yeah, he, he presents a, a, a big issue for them. I also want to say, because you brought up the weather, Amanda, that Arizona State said adamantly this week that the weather in Corvallis was not going to bother them, and it makes me wonder if, <laughs> you know, when you talk about something so much, it gets in a team's yeah. head, so yeah. if they're being asked about it constantly, maybe it's that seed has been planted. It's yeah. kind of like years ago, you know, there was this streak, uh, Oregon State kept going to Cal, winning and winning and winning, and it got in the Cal players' mm -hmm. heads, yeah. so... Is root, it, everyone root for it to be cold. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that you can take from facing Khalil Tate last week, or is it just they're so different that they can't really take much? Will said that he thought that what this week of practice, that what they prepared to do for Tate, even though it's different, like, it's not like you're going from um, Khalil Tate to KJ Costello at Stanford. You know, it's nice that there's some similarities. Yeah. So your kids already have these foundational blocks in their game plan, but it's just tough because, like I said, his arm is more of a threat. Yeah, and one of the things, like with Khalil Tate, that he was doing a lot of the game, this last game, was he was running uh, towards the backside. And he, you know, he was physically imposing. You know, I mean, like he was running over uh, certain players. I mean, he was running past certain players. Manny Wilkins won't do that. He'll try to juke them. He won't try to actually, like, run them over. So um, there was that aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, like I said, you know, um, if it's cold, if it is cold, they're going to run the ball a lot more. 
Um, so which means that you're going to see a handful of Baylidge and, and, you know, uh, I think I forget what the other kid's name is, Johnson or his backup. But, yeah, oh. they're going to run the ball a lot. And Arizona State, fifth in the Pac-12 in terms of total yards on offense. A big reason for that is their big-time receiver. And Keel Harry, he's got 889 yards so far this season. Second in the Pac-12, I believe 16th in the country. Here's what his teammates had to say about what makes him so effective. When guys have success early and they come in, they're highly recruited like he was. He's one of the top receivers in the country. Uh, you know, and then they make freshman All-American. You know, we, I talked to him about freshman All-Americans, not All-American. And he's he's capable of being All-American. In every single game, no matter who we play, you know, he was just big body in people, you know, and, and, and kind of just like basketball, boxing them out. And, you know, he'll run you over, he'll run around you. He's quick, he's fast. He's consistent every day of practice. And he... He's been ready to play since he got here. You, you get guys that are that talented, a lot of times you got to stay after him about working hard. Uh, you know, he's a guy that really works hard on the football field. So Oregon State has faced some pretty good receivers uh, throughout the season. I mean, you've got USC's Deontay Burnett, uh, but they actually kept him to two catches for 20 yards and a touchdown. Uh, of course, Colorado State. Where does he? Where does where does Harry stack up in in terms of the best receivers they've faced this season? Well, statistically, he will be the best receiver they face this season in terms of yards per game because he's second in the Pac-12 at 88 yards per game. Um, the, the Beavers have missed the two best receivers again, according to yards, in Darren Carrington at Utah, and then uh, Darren Andrews at UCLA. I would argue that Dante Pettis, Pettis at yeah, Washington sure. is a bigger threat because he can go for an explosive play at any point. Yeah. But that's kind of, sometimes I think someone that is more consistent game to game is a lot harder to shut down. Yeah, and, and he's bigger, you know, uh, you know, Nikhil Harry, I mean, he's like 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 yeah, 230, I, mean, so, yeah, I think. So, yeah. so, so he's a big, physically imposing receiver. They haven't seen much of that this year. I mean, they've seen like, you know, like the smallish receivers, they've seen uh, receivers that could, you know, catch really well, kind of, you know, along and lean. This guy's a big, is a big guy, he's a big dude. So uh, you could see just Harry by him. He can't, he's, I mean, this is a <laughs> like seven yards. Yeah, I mean, he's playing, he's, he's playing receiver, but he, he actually uh, plays the game like he's a running back, you know? So um, they're gonna have to prepare for that. We're going to have more on that matchup with uh, some of the, the secondary players. We're going to talk about Jay Irvine in just a little bit. Uh, but first, Arizona State's defense has been kind of all over the map this season. What should we expect from the Beavers? And what to expect from the Beavers' own defense? I just got to thank Coach Simon. Like, the workouts he put us through, through the whole summer. Then going into my junior season, it just all came together. And I just can't thank nobody but him. When Nick was playing, there was a lot of time to defensive Are you line. including yourself in that? I am including <laughs> okay, myself Okay, just want to make sure. And, and, and uh, linebacking core, and he still was doing his thing. Steven Jackson versus Steve Corey. Oh, oh, Steve Coach Jackson. Corey is but a legend here in Portland, and y'all did it to him like that? <laughs> put him against Stevie J? Like we have Terry Baker versus Brandon Cooks. Who is winning this one? There's only one player that's ever won the Heisman that's gone to the university, to Oregon State University, and that's Terry Baker. All right, we are getting down to it in our damn best bracket, taking a look at the defensive matchup we threw out there this week for you. Anoke Brexterfield versus Bill Swancutt. Who is moving on? And it is yeah. Bill Swancutt. So, so can I say something about, about, about <laughs> some of these? And, and Swan should have won this. But if you have a player that is from Oregon, and played at Oregon State and it was pretty good. Chances are, and you do, and you do one of these bowls. Chances <laughs> are, they're probably going to win. They're probably going to win. You know. So, I, you know. Anyway, I, I think Swanee deserved to win, and he won. So, I think they got it right. They got it right this time. All right. Well, we're taking a look at the next matchup. We're sticking with defense. And he is going on to face Nick Barnett. What do we think of this one? Well, Jason and I were just talking, like, I'm still mad that Jordan <laughs> Boyer did not advance. Um, the best player, according to award stuff, you know, the only person that was on the verge of being a unanimous All-American. Did we underseed Barnett? Should uh, he not be ooh, a four? Okay. Should he be higher? Uh, no, I, I think I think he's seed it right. I, I think, okay. yeah, so uh, who should win? Uh, I think, you know, I, oh man, this is this this is this really is a hard. One. I think <laughs> I think to me, Nick. Uh, no, you know what? Swanee should win. <laughs> Swanee should win. And the only reason okay. and the only reason why I say Swanee should win is because his senior year, there are games where he absolutely dominated the game. 
you know, uh, against the U, against U of O, against Oregon, he was unblockable. Like they couldn't block him. So Nick didn't really have that kind of like vintage kind of like, you know, like didn't have like that uh, significant games where he would just take over a game like that. He was just good on throughout the course of the year. Swanee had games where he was just, you know, unblockable. So that's the reason why I say. So he uh, is the best defensive player in Oregon State history. You're comfortable saying that? Uh. No, I think, I think Jordan, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan, should, is. Jordan, Jordan, is. Jordan, Jordan should have been the best defensive player in Oregon State history, but he's not on there. He's not there right. anymore. So I'll All say right. that. Well, you can vote. Weigh in on our Facebook page. Uh, so from past defensive stars to current ones, <coughs> sophomore cornerback Jay Irvine has been working back from injury for a majority of the season. He's most likely going to be matched up within Keel Harry this, uh, this Saturday against Arizona State. And he's known for being a beast in the weight room. He's going to take us through his workouts in our Buster's Barbecue Q&A. One more, one more. Yeah, because I had lost so much weight. I lost like 15, 20 pounds and not being able to lift, you know, I was kind of uh, depressed. Then as soon as they cleared me, I always, like when I was hurt, I always thought to myself, as soon as they cleared me, I was going to I was going to hit it and go hard, and as soon as they clear me, every day I just work out like uh, twice a day. And then when I get home that night, I was trying to catch up with everybody else. So I do like 200 push-ups a night, then wake up in the morning and do like 100, and I just do it every day. <laughs> Uh, if I remember, uh, squat was 500. I think bench was 315, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. I think that's about it. I just got to thank Coach Simon. You know, um, coming in as a freshman, I had I had the athletic ability to do it, but the strength, like the workouts he put us through through the whole summer, then my sophomore year, then still doing a lot of uh, strength conditioning, then going into my junior season, it just all came together, and I just can't thank nobody but him. Man, squatting 500 pounds, two and a half times his body weight. Man, that's pretty good. You're probably pretty close to that, like 499. No. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So Here when I go. played, when, when I played, I actually squatted 600 plus pounds. Allegedly. So, no, it's not allegedly. You know, what, you know what? what? what There's uh, two, 245. No, so <laughs> I, I had the proof on that. Not only that, but I benched for. He's five, also two. in the secondary. Oh, so there you go. Okay, that's See, why he's. Doing, I mean, that's why. Okay, <laughs> can I say something about that too? That's the reason why he's only doing 100 push-ups. So he, when he gets up in the morning, if he, was, if he was a D lineman or if he was a linebacker, he'd be up that up to like 250, 300. You know. So. Wow. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know that I could do like five push-ups. Uh, like, just saying, like, you know. How does some variety on the panel? How does that that kind of strength, that elite strength, translate? Where does it translate well, the most? You okay. Think? Well, well, they say that you know the stronger that you are, the um, like fast switch muscles, right? So if you're stronger, then you should have the ability to have like fast switch muscles and be able to like to explode. So if he's that strong and, and with the ability that he has uh, in the weight room, that should translate really well onto the field. What stinks to me is that someone that has that kind of work ethic, you want that kid on the field all the time, and he's just been battling injuries sure. so yeah. much, sure. you know? And that's hard. That takes down team morale. And then that's usually the kid that's saying, hey, we're going to get in the weight room and work in the yep. offseason. I don't care that, you know, it's bye weekend. We're going to be working out. But when he's, you know, on the sideline, you don't have that. It doesn't help. Yeah, we were just saying that off camera. Like, how many games has he actually played this year? Right. You know, so, I mean, you have that kind of talent, you know, uh, in the weight room. And someone that, with that kind of mentality, you want him on the field so he could make a difference on the field, not off the field. You want him on the field. Well, more to come. But right now, we're getting you over to the OSU Beaver store. Hey Beaver Nation, I'm Melanie. I'm here at the OSU Beaver Store campus location. It's starting to get cold outside. It's time for the beanie hat. I'm here in the women's section. We got a huge selection of colors and styles. We've got the new beaver head. We've got the Benny that I'm wearing. We've even got gloves that match. Come on in, find all these and more at the OSU Beaver Store Fan Start here. Welcome back. Well, ASU has struggled throughout the years with the turnover battle, but take a look at the turnaround they've had this season, going from 21 tied for 82nd in college football last season to top four. They have had eight all season. Uh, how have they been able to get that done? I, I can tell you right now, that's, uh, that's due to Manny Wilkins. I mean, the kid, 
really does take care of the football. I mean, and, uh, you know, when you have a quarterback that has the ability to make passes and be as efficient as he's been without turning the ball over, it's huge. I'm sure USC could probably use some of that, you know, with, <laughs> with Sam Darnold right now. But, uh, no, I mean, the kid is efficient. He takes care of the ball. If you don't, if he, uh, if he can't make a play, he doesn't force it, which is huge, especially at this level. So I think he, that's what, the reason why they have the results that they've had. Statistically, their defense is one of the worst in college football. 113th in total defense. They give up around 455 yards a game. They've been kind of all over the place because they played well against Washington, but then they gave up like over 300 yards to Bryce Love. So what's, what's going on here? What do we expect from this? Okay, I have a lot of thoughts about the Arizona State defense because they hired a new coordinator this year. So anytime you bring in a new coordinator, that's going to change things, takes time to get used to it, et cetera, et cetera. It's Phil Bennett who came from Baylor, who in my opinion should not be coaching in college football. He was the defensive coordinator at Baylor when more than 50 women are alleged to have been raped by members of the football team. It was a disaster. Art Bryles lost his job. I do not think any Baylor assistant should have a job in college football right now. When Bennett was at Baylor, they won. That's why he has a job. That's why Todd, Todd Graham came into this season on the hot seat. He knows that. He knew they had to be better. And so, Bennett is a good coach. So you bring someone in like that and they've had enough games where they've played really well and then they've had games where they've played terrible but it balances out, you know, and you notch like one of the biggest, one of the most marquee wins of the college football season in UW. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. Like Bennett should not be coaching in, in, on any team or any university after what he went through in, in, at Baylor. So I couldn't agree with you more on that point. Uh, as far as, again, their defense, they are 11th in the Pac-12 in big chunk yardage plays. Can that be an area for the Beavers to exploit? Oh, and, and who do you expect to step up of the receivers? Because we haven't, there really well, hasn't According been to the one. poll, it should be Jordan Villeman. Jordan Villeman, Villeman yeah. senior day. I mean, Isaiah Hodgins, you know, to me, is the, is the best receiver in that receiving core uh, that uh, Oregon State has. So, um, you know, if there's going to be someone who's going to step up, it'll be him or Noah uh, Togia, the tight end. Uh, other than that, the same. It's the same. It's the same too. Tyner and all. You yep. know. So I mean, and, that, and that's really where, where uh, we're at right now. Especially if it's cold and you're going to run the ball. Both of them on the field at the same time. Uh, second half in the Arizona game, they both played really well. Um, you know, uh, Tyner really had like a pep in his step. Had that swagger that we've been looking for finally. Um, Nall, because of what Tyner was doing, also started to have a little bit uh, more swagger, started talking and stuff I think like they that. Push I love to see each that. Other. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, maybe, hopefully, we get back to what we saw in Stanford and Colorado with the running game and this offense, and that's where they, you know. With with Hodgins, I mean, he he, he had so so much so much experience this season, targeted so many times. I mean, how do you feel like the season will translate next year for him? Okay, well, is Isaiah Hodgins going to be a Beaver next year? I think that's that is a really also a million dollar question. question. Yeah. You know, we don't know what's going to happen when a new staff comes in in terms of what are they going to run. Uh, is there going to be a place for him? Is, does he, do he and his family still want to be part of Oregon State? You know, as we talked about on Wednesday, his younger brother is committed. He's a defensive tackle as of right now. So all all of those things. But playing a lot as a true freshman, it's huge. I mean, I talk about this all the time. In 2011, when Oregon State was terrible, they were bad because they were playing so many freshmen that were supposed yeah. to redshirt, but they had so many injuries, they had to play all these kids. Then you get to 2012, and they start the season 6-0 and because all those kids had experience. Yeah, experience, right. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I say that he does return, that he comes back to Oregon State, because if his brother's coming here, sure. chances are that, is that he's going to come here. I'm going to just name a couple of true freshmen that played. Tell me if you uh, recognize any of these, these names. Bill Swancutt, Derek Anderson, no, Bill Swancutt, Stephen Jackson. No, Bill Swancutt, that? All, Jordan Poyer. <laughs> Jordan Poyer. All these players played as true freshmen. And look, and look at Cooks the... Did, didn't he? Brandon Cooks did yeah. as well. So look at all these players and look how well they did for the university. Absolutely. So I think Nothing Isaiah like Hodges has a bright, bright future ahead of him. And you, again, nobody else, so you're going to get a lot of balls thrown your way, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, coming up after the break, we're handing out our ingredients to victory. And it's almost Civil War week. We have plenty of Beavers coverage coming your way next week, starting with Talking Beavers on Tuesday at 7 p.m., Inside the Huddle Thursday at 9, and Go Beavs pregame edition Friday night at 9 p.m. Research Stadium getting set to host Arizona State on Senior Day coming up tomorrow at noon. What will the weekend bring? 
And of course, we're going to be handing out our ingredients to victory. And we asked you, the fans, what some of your ingredients to victories would be. And Nate Edwards says, besides the obvious, playing with energy on defense, winning the turnover battle, and establishing the run game early, OSU will need to rely on the secondary to prevent big plays, use the Wildcat other trickery to get this victory. That guy is he, taking advantage of 280 characters. <laughs> absolutely. He is predicting an update, an, an upset, not an update. Yeah. Uh, and of course, now time for our ingredients to victory brought to you by Papa John's. And Lindsay, what is your ingredient to victory? Okay, well, we just talked about, you know, ASU doesn't turn the ball over very much. So I think that Oregon State's got to turn them over at least once. And then more importantly, take that turnover, turn it into a touchdown. Ooh. Not a field goal, a touchdown. You got to get some points off turnovers. And then I also think that this is a great time for a big special teams play. You don't have to take a kick back for a touchdown necessarily, but I think something to get the momentum going, put the offense in a really good field position. Well, well, I'll tell you, the Nate guy, like he, he took a little bit of each of our... <laughs> he's like, I was like, no, he's right on. He's right on. He's like, yeah, he's, so he's right on. So one of the things for me um, is stop the run. Stop the run. They haven't, they haven't done it. They haven't done it in these last couple games. Against Arizona, they didn't do it. You know, they didn't do it against Cal, obviously. So they need to stop the run first and foremost. Secondly, I think what they need to do is also play with energy. Playing with energy is a key uh, component for this team because when they play with energy, they play a lot better. Um, being back at home, hopefully we could get back to how they played against Stanford and how they played against uh, Colorado. If they do that, I think you could probably see uh, upset. So. And as we were talking that. about in the headlines, uh, Coach Hall obviously wanting to take uh, a little more, um, a little more, want to be a little more active with with defense. He says he wants to simplify it. He's going to take a larger role on with it. What do you think we're going to see from the defense this weekend? Like, do you think that there will be wholesale changes, or, or you think again it's just going to be things reduced? Well, well, one of the things for me is that I think he should have had an imprint on the defense long ago. You know, the fact that like. You know, uh, he, he stated that, you know, he was going to do it now. I think he should have done it once he took over. But, yeah, I think you'll see different, you know, reckless abandon is what he wants them to play with. And I think that's what you'll see come this game. Yeah, I think, and that's what we saw in the Colorado and Stanford games, right, that they had simplified things a little bit and guys were just playing really, really hard. That's yeah, what you need. Fast. Maybe they were making a mistake, but they made it full speed. Yeah. So is this game winnable? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, I, and I've said since the Colorado game, I think they're going to beat someone. So maybe they only got two weeks, it. so it you know, but I think people would rather have a win over the Ducks. <laughs> yeah. so and and you were it. saying that if they beat the Ducks, all this is a race? No, 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 no. Oh, I didn't say that. Evans said that. I said absolutely not. I said absolutely not. I said absolutely not. No. Win the game, though. Win the game. Win it. <laughs> all right, we'll see you back here for Talking Beavers next week.